I'm Charles Cooper, and on behalf of Signal Outdoors, we're really excited today to have a conversation with Clark Rockfall, who's the Director of Advocacy and Government Relations at the American Council of the Blind. Clark, good to be with you. Good to be with you as well, Charles. Thank you to you and Signal for having me for this conversation today. Absolutely. Well, I, I know before we, we talk about all the cool work that you and ACB are doing, uh, you're a huge outdoorist and a former competitive cyclist and have had lots of very cool outdoor adventures. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the role that outdoor recreation has played in, in your life? Absolutely. So for me personally, I grew up outdoors. You know, I was born and raised in Annapolis, Maryland. And every day after school, you know, it's basically sitting on a football or sitting there with my glove and bat and ball in the family room, waiting for my dad to come home from work so that we could go out into the backyard. You know, he barely had time to take off his coat and tie before I was already in the backyard, throwing the ball up in the air and catching it myself. Uh, as I got older, so I have a degenerative eye condition. So my vision slowly deteriorated over time. You know, baseball became softball. Uh, team sports became more difficult. So I had to find different ways to be active in the outdoors. Uh, riding my own bike became riding a tandem bike, you know, bicycle built for two with, with my family. And I took up wrestling in high school because wrestling was one of the few sports that I knew about at the time that had adaptive rules for visually impaired athletes. That progressed from my, from my childhood into my adult life uh, when I discovered the U.S. Association of Blind Athletes and the Paralympic Games. Uh, so the Paralympic Games are parallel to the Olympics for athletes with physical disabilities. And that's when I started to pursue tandem cycling, uh, not just recreationally, but competitively. And I got to tell you what, Charles, being outdoors, but also having a competitive outlet, um, it was great for me academically, professionally, uh, just personal development wise. There's nothing like pushing yourself to the limit, being part of a team, uh, figuring out how to problem solve, uh, developing grit and determination to achieve a goal. And being a cyclist, you get to do that outdoors in some pretty cool places. So I first got my National Park Access Pass uh, when I was training down in Tucson, Arizona, and we would go to Suaro National Monument east of Tucson. Uh, and we, would, of course, go there and ride under the 15 mile an hour speed limit, <coughs> uh, but just do some, some great training hot laps there through the park and, you know, in the outdoors. That's awesome. And uh, nowadays, I assume you're not competitive cycling all over the world. So what's, uh, what's the outdoor adventure you spend most time, time doing around Maryland? Sure. So you say grew up in Maryland, now live in Alexandria, Virginia. So, uh, some of my favorite outdoor hobbies now include paddle boarding, whether that's you know, in the rivers, streams, and the Chesapeake all around the, the DMV area and trying to get out on as many trails as possible, uh, whether that's Roosevelt Island, right off the shore of the Potomac in Virginia, or getting out to some of our local uh, national forests, as well as national parks, like the George Washington National Forest or Shenandoah. Um, and before we even started this conversation, Charles, I was mentioning that we're coming up, my wife and I are coming up on our two-year wedding anniversary. We actually got engaged during the solar eclipse of 2017, just outside of Great Smokies National Park down in Tennessee. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, it makes me think that maybe we should have done this discussion out hiking on a trail instead of uh, virtually on the computer. But, but tell me a little bit about... Uh, the awesome work that you're doing with the American Council of the Blind. Uh, I know they're doing amazing things. Can you tell us a little bit about ACB's mission and the role ACB is playing in creating equity and access for people who are blind? Absolutely. So the ACB, the American Council of the Blind, we are a member-driven nationwide organization uh, with a mission to increase the security, independence, 
equal opportunity and quality of life for people who are blind and visually impaired. Uh, so there's a, a lot going on in, in, in that mission statement. Uh, so boiling that down, we are a grassroots consumer membership organization. We have state and special interest affiliates all throughout the country, uh, including local chapters, even within our state affiliates and relevant to the, the outdoors and being active outside, uh, going back to that mission of increasing the independence and equal opportunity for people who are blind and visually impaired. So how do we do that? Uh, ACB, we are actively working with the National Park Service to not only make their indoor facilities and exhibits more accessible and more inviting to people who are blind and visually impaired, whether that's adding audio description to the videos on their websites, as well as in their visitor center and other, uh, you know, information centers throughout the national park system. We're also working with them to modernize their websites as well as to describe the uniform park brochures. So every national park has a park brochure. It's all in the same layout and template. And one of the things we're doing is working with the park service including the park rangers and park employees to provide descriptions for the images, the photographs, and yes, even the maps of the parks or of the specific location. And by working directly with the park staff, um, it's a great way to educate them and have them be part of the process so they understand uh, really what it takes to make a, a quality description, how we can best display and describe that information for visitors of all abilities and make the parks a more inviting space for people who are blind and visually impaired. That's great. And you know, I've seen a lot of progress actually made by the park service and other federal agencies on trying to create a better experience for people who are blind. Uh, so I'm glad you're doing a lot of work on that. One question I had, Clark, is walk, walk through some of the, the technologies that have become available that are now being utilized to, to create sort of a better experience for people when they're in the outdoors. The question about technology and how technology can be used by people who are blind and visually impaired, um, especially in outdoor environments, is a really interesting one, Charles. Um, so working directly with the park service, um, accessibility can be everything from hands-on tactile displays and exhibits, uh, accessing information electronically via the park website, audio description, whether it's provided embedded in a video or description that's provided uh, via an app or an auxiliary aid as you navigate the, the grounds or the different sites within a park. But there's a lot of consumer technology that is proving just more and more useful uh, to people with disabilities in the outdoor settings. Uh, some that immediately come to mind are just the, the consumer mapping services, right? Uh, you can name a lot of names here, but Apple, Google, things like that where you can have walking directions and the walking directions are getting more and more accurate uh, for not only roads, but trails, walking paths, bike paths. Um, it's still incumbent on the user to have uh, good O&M skills, orientation and mobility skills to be a, a, you know, if they use a mobility aid such as a cane or a service dog uh, to be proficient in those skills, but to have the enhancement of these mapping services and some other additional technologies such as Soundscape, which creates a basically an audio map. So not just relying on visual data, but how we can use uh, sound and stereo sound, 3D sound, as well as haptic and vibration feedbacks 
to give more nuance and more texture to the visual information that's displayed um, on a phone or a mapping system. In addition to those services, wearable technology is becoming more and more advanced. So not only can we be outdoors and enjoying our surroundings, but we also have some data that we can track our progress. Um, if it's a some sort of a fitness challenge, right? Or if we have daily goals, we can stay up to up to date, up to the minute, up to the step on how well we are doing, not only getting out and exploring the great outdoors, but really taking charge of our own physical fitness and mental well-being, which can really stave off a lot of health conditions that plague the disability communities. That's great. And thanks for thanks for walking through that. Clark, that's a really good comprehensive answer and, and appreciate sort of learning more and getting more insight around how innovation and technology is helping get more people outdoors. Uh, you've been talking a lot about the work you're doing with the federal government, specifically the National Park Service. What, what's happening beyond the federal government? Are there, are there efforts on the state and local level and other venues for outdoor recreation uh, similar to what's happening at the federal level to, to find more opportunity to create equitable experiences for people who are blind? Charles, there's a lot of work being done at the, the state and local level to increase accessibility. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to plug a project of the American Council of the Blind, the Audio Description Project. So you, uh, your listeners and viewers can visit acb.org slash ADP for Audio Description Project. And there we're compiling a list of the parks, museums, theaters, venues, uh, that offer audio description and audio described content. Uh, just another way to kind of share the love, right? And spread the word about those state parks, local parks that are offering accessible content uh, for people who are blind, low vision, whether they're ACB members or members of the broader community. Uh, at ACB, our members and our state and state affiliates and local chapters uh, they're doing a lot of great work with local parks and local governments to make them more accessible. In some ways, they're more accessible than the, the national parks because they're in our backyard, right? We have uh, you know, high quality wireless coverage in a lot of these local parks. So a lot of those technologies that I was mentioning earlier um, can be very useful for navigating the local park. But we also need to make sure that how we get to and from the park is accessible as well. So at ACB and our members are working with departments of transportation, and state, local, city governments around the nation to improve our transportation infrastructure. And an overlooked aspect of this is, you know, a lot of people think transportation, well, that's your taxis, ride shares, hopefully someday autonomous vehicles and <laughs> flying helicopters. Uh, in addition to your bus and train service, but it's also how you get door to door, right? How do you get to and from that ride share or that bus to that state and local park? And one area that ACB is working that we've had some recent success has been expanding the use of accessible pedestrian signals so that people who are blind and low vision can independently navigate their local communities so that we have access to the information that's always been displayed visually, right? Whether it's the back in the olden days, the stop, go little sign that would flip out. And now it's either the red hand or the walk stick figure. Um, but in a, a busy city, say for example, like in New York City, where that information is very infrequently displayed other than visually, um, We've really been working hard and the courts have now agreed with us that intersections need to be made accessible, not only for people who can visually see the signs, not only for those in wheelchairs or with uh, mobility aids or even parents with strollers, right? We need curb cuts everywhere, but we also need to display that information um, in other accessible means. So 
we're really working hard to expand the availability of accessible pedestrian signals that have audible as well as like vibration tactile feedback so that if it is a loud city and you can't hear the signal or you're somebody who's uh, deaf hard of hearing or deaf blind, you can place your hand on the signal and feel the haptic vibration as well. And I think that'll go a long way to getting more people with disabilities, more individuals who are blind and low vision out in our local communities and really experiencing and enjoying all that our state and local parks have to offer. And are, is that happening? Are local communities actually implementing and adopting those technologies or is that, is that what we're hoping for in the future? It's an ongoing process. Um, so just in the month of October, the ACB of New York, uh, along with Council Disability Rights Advocates, um, had a successful ruling against the city of New York because less than 4% of intersections in New York City offered um, accessible pedestrian signals. Um, and although New York City is a, a very egregious case, it is not the only city or locality that, that has available a very small number of accessible pedestrian signals. Um, so it is work that's being done. We hope that that ruling will help spur the city into action, but also uh, serve as you know, a marquee to other states and local governments that this is something that you need to do. You cannot ignore your citizens who are blind and low vision. Um, you cannot ignore the disability community. And it goes right to the heart of our mission, you know, increasing independence, increasing equal opportunity. And again, there are so many health conditions. Diabetes is the leading cause of blindness for working age adults in the United States. Uh, obesity rates are through the roof. Heart conditions, uh, people who are blind and low vision are significantly more likely to have chronic heart conditions than our able-bodied peers. So how can we get out? How can we get up and get moving if the infrastructure around us is inhibiting that behavior? And, and Clark, I wanted to ask you a little bit about that. You know, we are in the middle of this uh, COVID pandemic or we wouldn't be doing this virtually. And one thing that has been recognized across the country is because of the COVID pandemic, people have been relying on outdoor recreation really for health and wellness and, and as an escape from some of the, the difficulties that the pandemic is bringing. We've seen across the, across the country a real boom in people getting on bikes and hiking on trails and taking their family out for walks. And... Uh, getting on kayaks and enjoying national parks and local, local uh, parks as well. I guess my question is, it seems like peop for people who are blind, COVID would, would create some additional barriers to some of those health and wellness benefits. Can you talk a little bit about, about that? Have you analyzed that? Uh, what do you understand as sort of the, the developing problem there? Uh, that's a a very insightful question, Charles, and I, I hear you. Uh, I know you are a, a big fan of the outdoors. My, my wife and I, we've been treating Prince William National Forest uh, just in Northern Virginia here kind of as our COVID quarantine playground. And certainly as uh, you know, social distancing and the, the pandemic has lingered, the, the parks have certainly become more crowded. And we're very fortunate that in, in Northern Virginia, we have a just a great trail infrastructure, right? Uh, all the rail to trail projects that have been done in our area. I mean, we have, we have hundreds of miles of trails interconnecting Virginia, DC and Maryland. And there, there's nothing I love more than you know, morning walks with, with my wife or taking you know, not a service dog, but just our, our pet dogs out on trail um, and letting them go to town and treating, especially our large American bulldog, like she is a service dog because she just flows like water and finds the path of least resistance. 
but you you hit the nail right on the head. The the COVID pandemic has raised a lot of challenges for many individuals with disabilities, especially people who are blind and low vision. Um, you know the the largest number of people who are blind and low vision in the United States are people with age-related vision loss. So already you're elderly, so you could have more uh, severe reactions if you were to contract the virus. Um, for working age adults, as I stated earlier, the primary cause of vision loss for those 25 to 65 is due to diabetic retinopathy. Um, you know, vision loss related to type one and type two diabetes. And as, as we know from our health community and scientific reports and studies, uh, diabetes can be a comorbid condition resulting in more severe infection if you contract the virus. So already with the virus itself, you have conditions resulting in vision loss that make people, you know, underlying health conditions that make people more susceptible to the virus that may keep them indoors or more isolated. Add on top of that, folks, if, especially if they're living alone, um, may have more difficulty getting to stores or doing their shopping a lot of transportation systems and services were scaled back, um, especially in the early days of the pandemic. But in addition to not being able to get to a store in person, a lot of online shopping and delivery services were just slammed, right? Uh, some grocery delivery services had two week delays. So if, you, <laughs> uh, if you're like me and you're not such a great planner, you could be really out of luck when ordering some groceries if you waited till the last minute. So it, what does this all mean? Uh, it means you have folks who are more likely to be staying indoors due to being more susceptible to more severe infections due to the virus. You have folks who are already predisposed to uh, underlying health conditions that may have resulted in their vision loss or may have been exacerbated by their vision loss. So now we have people with underlying health conditions who have you know, blind or visually impaired and who now may not feel safe either A, getting outdoors or may not have the tools and resources, accessible tools and resources they need to stay physically and mentally fit while socially isolated and social distancing. So in addition to the work we're doing with the outdoors, the national parks, uh, state and local governments to improve infrastructure, we're also working with our corporate partners to expand access to exercise and fitness equipment, as well as accessible media uh, and, and information and communications. So Clark, the, the work you're doing is clearly really important uh, at all levels. And we work obviously within the outdoor community and given everything that you're doing, how can the outdoor community be helpful in advancing the important work that you and your colleagues at ACB are doing? Charles, in the disability community, there's a, a long standing mantra of nothing about us without us. And if the, the outdoor community is truly interested to engage the disability community and make outdoor spaces more inviting for people with disabilities, include us in the conversations. Um, again, nothing about us without us. In 2021, ACB will be launching a broad health and wellness campaign uh, because the COVID-19 pandemic, the uh, just ever increasing rates of diabetes and di diabetic retinopathy, diabetes related vision loss uh, for our community is reaching epidemic proportions. So a, a challenge from, 
from me and ACB to the outdoor community would be include us in the work that you're doing. Bring us in, have the disability community have a seat or seats at the table so that as you're developing these plans, whether it's increasing the amount of uh, bike lanes and bike paths, multi-use paths and trails, including the disability community in those conversations so that we can all share the outdoors together. Or if it's for uh, companies providing outdoor uh, equipment, gear, information, include us in the conversation about how your digital assets can be made more accessible or what sort of in-store experience would make, you know, not, not just the outdoors themselves, but even before we get to that point, make it an enjoyable experience so that more people want to take part in the services that you're providing, as well as experience, uh, you know, just the great landscapes and natural beauty and wonder that our nation has to offer. Awesome. Well, Clark, I really appreciate your time. Uh, it's clear that you all are doing really great work for the outdoors and for people who are, who are blind and, and facing vision loss and really appreciate the, the conversation and hope next time we can do it out on the trail. Thanks very much. Sounds great, Charles. And thank you. For anyone that wants to learn more about ACB, please visit acb.org. And if you do want to have a conversation, please reach out to uh, the ACB National Office, either myself or others. And the best way to do that is by emailing advocacy at acb.org. Great. Thank you very much, Clark. I Thanks, Charles. Have a great day.